Mr. and Mrs. North, starring Barbara Britton and Richard Denning. you do anything but sit around and drink beer? Looks great for a big author, doesn't it? Just sitting around, swilling brew. Look at this place. Why don't we go back to New York? Why do we have to live out here? Why don't you shut up? When he can't think of anything else to say, he just says, shut up. Well, why don't you do something about it? Okay, there is something I can do about it. I can keep your mouth shut. So you don't like it up here and you think you're having a rough time, huh? Where do you think you'd be if I hadn't pulled you out of the gutter? I'll tell you where you'd be. You open your mouth again. Get the door, will you, kid? Sit down, I'll get it myself. Get off the buzzer, I'm coming. Well, I was beginning to think we'd come to the wrong place. And we'd send the taxi away. Jerry North, what brings you up into this neck of the woods? Just been asking Pam that same question. You've been evicted? Oh, Mr. Kovac, I'd always thought of you as a serious writer. Are you uh, going to keep us standing out here all night? No, no, come on in. You, uh, you want a drink? Some beer? Well, if you don't mind, I'd prefer... Uh, uh, yes, thank you. Uh, Jerry'd love a glass of beer, wouldn't you, dear? Yes, yes, wouldn't we? Come on in. Harris, get a couple of cold bottles. believe we've met your other guests. Oh, uh, this is my wife, Sally. Oh, how do you do, Mrs. Kovac? This is Sarge Stewart. The Sarge and I were together in the Air Force. Jerry North, my publisher. Hi. And I'm Pam North, his publisher's wife. This is Harris. He's my uh, secretary. You know, Mr. Kovac, your voice sounds quite different over the phone. My voice sounds what? He never sounds different. He always sounds the same. All right, secretary, give me another beer. Well, I, I guess you came up to talk about the story. Well, you needn't have bothered. I was coming to town tomorrow anyhow. I shouldn't have bothered. At your invitation, I left my comfortable apartment, spent two miserable hours on the train, permanently dislocated my sacroiliac in a taxi with an idiot driver, all to spend a lovely weekend in the country. Ha, ha, ha. I invited you? You're kidding. I was never more serious. What does he mean, I invited him? Well, actually, you didn't invite him. You invited me, and I invited him. <laughs> what is this, a gag? You invited us to dinner and the weekend. Of course, if you've changed your mind, we're perfectly willing to walk the three miles back to the station. Be more comfortable than taking a taxi. Oh, wait a minute. Let's get this straight. I called and invited you up here for a weekend. You did. Either you're crazy or I am. I'm perfectly willing to debate it with you. Uh, there must be some mix-up. Come on, as long as you're here, sit down. We'll have a gab for a while. Are Mr. and Mrs. North going to spend the night? Oh. Yeah, I guess they'll have to. Go fix up the back bedroom. Well, you heard him. Now, not tomorrow, now. Well, now, Jerry, wasn't that nice? Yes. I don't know when I've had such a delicious dinner. I wonder if I might have some more coffee. Harris. Coffee. Oh, I'll get it. Oh, do you write too? 
Well, I... Huh. Yeah, he writes, uh, poems. Clean off the plate, sweet kid. Yeah, he even wrote one about me once. Honest, a poem. There was a part in it about my hair, like a cloudy sunrise. Oh, he's crazy. Uh, Jerry, didn't you want to talk to Mr. Kovac about his book? Oh, yes. As a matter of fact, I did. Excuse me, I'll get it. Thank you. Oh, do you mind? Well, no, I, I wanted to talk to you anyhow. What are your husband? About your poems? A have you ever published any? Nobody ever buys poems. They only pay for trash, like... Like Chuck Kovac's books? Uh, do you mind if I read some? Are you afraid of what they might say? I gather that you're fond of Mrs. Kovac. But you, you don't care for Mr. Kovac or for Mr. Stewart. Sarge is my brother. I'd like to kill him. The chapter on the court martial is all right, but there's too much brutality in the guardhouse scene. The public pays to read about things they haven't got the nerve to do themselves. Besides, you've got a lot of opinions for a guy making a lot of loot off me. I don't deny there's a certain audience for your stuff, Kovac. But as long as I'm your publisher, I'll decide what we can use. Well, I think I'll go down the lake and grab a swim before I turn in. Wait, I want to talk to you. Well, it's been a very interesting evening. Wait a minute, I'll show you your room. Oh, I'll take them. This way, please. Good night. You stay here. Does everyone sleep up here? Well, the rest do. I have a cabin outside. My notebook back, Mrs. North. Well, if you don't mind, I'd like to keep it tonight to read your poems. No, I don't mind at all. It's, it's very kind of you. Oh, Mr. North, there's something I ought to tell you. Harris! Good night. Good night, Mr. Good night. Jim, what do you think about that invitation? An idiotic practical joke, I suppose. Any kind of a joke. If Mr. Kovac's books make so much money, why does he live in a place like this? Probably thrifty. <laughs> Jerry, you publish poetry. And I lose money on it. Let me read you some of Mr. Stewart's poems. I think he's a new find. Oh, no, not tonight, dear. Come on, let's get some sleep. Listen. So love is lost to me. I still may know the same hard distance of the stars. The wan white wildness of the winter moon. A meeting in a cabin midst a night of duress would explain a call from one in distress. Hmm? Jerry, listen to this. Go to sleep, dear. But Jerry, I think that young man's in trouble and is trying to get a message to us. Go to sleep. Jerry, I think this is serious. Wow. Jerry. I got something else on my mind. That phone call to the Norths. Who did it? Well, don't look at me. They could tell you a lot. Well? They said it wasn't a woman's voice, didn't they? Yeah. Oh, 
One of them must have done it. They've been crossing you up a long time. Why, just this evening, I watched them outside the window. She, she was planning to run away with them. That's not news to me, Harris. I've known that a long time. Wipe that lipstick off your kisser. Off, smart guy. Yeah. Only I can do it better. Well, bring you wait, wait, I'm I'm not, not, I, I, wait a minute. I don't want to get in a beef with you now. More important to find out who made the phone call. Okay, kid, why'd you do it? Do what? You know what I'm talking about. You just used Sally and Sarge to throw me off the track. You made that call, didn't you? Why should I do anything like that, Chuck? I didn't ask you why. I just want to know if you did it. No, no. Why, you sniffling liar! Wait a minute, we're not alone in the house. Use your head. Yeah, you're right. I'll talk to you later. I got a whole lot to say to you two. A whole lot. around here somewhere. You know, if you'd used that flashlight earlier, we'd have avoided a collision. Oh, I, I guess I was confused. I, I thought I heard a noise. Oh, there was no noise. It was my wife. I just came down to look for her. Mr. North, you're quite a character. Well, I guess I'd better say good night now. I'm, I'm pretty tired. Uh, Mrs. Kovac, is there anything wrong? Oh, no. No, of course not. I just... to be in the middle of the night. Someday you're going to stick that pretty nose of yours into something that'll bite it off. Now, you're going back and stay in that bed if I have to tie you in it. I'm practically not breathing. Look. As I can tell, Sheriff, Mrs. Kovac was just lying there on the floor. I've told you this 20 times now. And now she's gone and nobody knows where she went. Why don't you ask him? She was your wife. Why don't you tell him what happened? You don't seem very upset over your brother's death, Mr. Stewart. I'm more upset than I look. Kovac, she was your wife. And if she didn't kill him, why was she running away when she bumped into North? Well, we, we had a little argument. About Harris? Are you kidding? It was a private matter. Then why did she kill him? Oh, it's an open and shut case. Well, it seems like very weak circumstantial evidence to me. I'm sure that if Bill or any New York Damn, detective... please. Well, I know that Bill or anyone at Homicide in New York wouldn't form an opinion on so little evidence. Well, he hasn't even searched the rooms or anything. Just a minute, young lady. I don't need any big city detective to solve this case, and I don't need any help from amateurs either. This is a matter of chers de la femme. 
Which means, uh, find the woman, and that's just what I'm going to do. I'll broadcast an alarm over my radio telephone. Now, Pam, please, will you stay out of this? But why should Mrs. Kovac... I beg you, just this once, huh? Car number one to control, over. Control to car number one, come in. Roger, control. Don't you have to file a flight plan for that, Sheriff? I want an alarm broadcast for Sally Kovac. Five feet, four inches, age 25, and wearing a light camel hair coat, no hat. Roger. Side note, see what happens when you believe circumstantial evidence? <clears throat> when a guy like me falls in love, there's only one way out. <laughs> so he killed himself. Lieutenant Wigan would have found that out before he broadcast the alarm for Mrs. Kovac. Well, I had to be thorough. I knew something was wrong when... You knew something was Sheriff, wrong. Sheriff, you won't be needing us anymore, will you? No, it's an open and shut case. I'll take your numbers where I can reach you, <laughs> if any further questioning is necessary. Thank you. Come on, but Jerry, <laughs> Jerry, it's too easy. Everything fits too well. I don't want to hear another word out of you. Now go upstairs and get the bags packed. We're getting out of here on the first train back to our nice stuffy apartment. But I upstairs. Yes, dear. Up. something on my mind. First, I want to get you straight. I don't understand. I mean that just because we're out of the city doesn't mean that I'm in a hayseed cup. No, sirree. Right here in this county last year, there were seven felonies and 20 misdemeanors, not to mention a manslaughter and uh, <coughs> a suspicion. Suspicion of what?
There's been a lot of books by wardens, FBI men, big city detectives, but there's never been one about a country sheriff. You know that cop's trying to push me off the bestseller list? I got news for you. You already pushed. Nobody pushes me around. North, that cop, and especially you. What's the matter? I gotta be wrong, but it looks like a light in the cabin. in his handwriting. But this suicide note isn't. And besides, there's a line of dialogue right out of the scripture on page 70. You're pretty cute, aren't you? Y you stay back. My husband is just inside the house. He'll never hear you. Law and order is out there trying to sell him his autobiography. Whatever we say here is confidential. You didn't write the novels. Harris did. You're pretty sharp, too, Mrs. North. Sure, he wrote the stuff. He got a kick out of it. He was a little guy. He could write about a lot of things he never could really do. And you got all the credit. And his brother spent the money with you. But why did you invite us down here? What are you talking about? I never invited you up here. He did. He was sore about the money and Sally. He was going to tell your husband that he had been ghostwriting my stuff. That's kind of a funny term now, isn't it? And Sally left because she knew you were through. That you couldn't earn any more money now that Harris was dead. Oh, now let's not jump to conclusions, Mrs. North. Give me that note. Oh, I will not. It's, it's evidence proves that you're guilty. Give me that note! <laughs> We're getting down to the jail. They may have brought that girl in for now. And I want to thank you, Mr. North, for your encouragement. I'm going to take your advice about my book and write it. Good, you do that. It's a fire. Ah. Hey, come out of there, you little mink. Come out. A lot of interesting things happen in the life of a country sheriff, like the country doctor. <laughs> you don't get the fame and prestige of the big city men, but he gets the job done. Yeah, but you're giving in to city ways yourself, Sheriff. But I'm not so sure scientific progress is a good thing in your case. You know, if you'd been riding a horse instead of driving that car, you'd have gotten your man alive. <laughs> well, if I'm taking you to the station, we better get moving. That's right, let's go. Well, what are you going to do with the poems? Publish them. Thank you, Jerry. Oh, I'm not being sentimental. They're good. So are you, Mr. North. If you want to catch the 720, I'll take the shortcut out by Jonestown. Otherwise, you'll have to wait until 815 and... Uh... <laughs> I'll take the long way. Mr. and Mrs. North is directed by Ralph Francis Murphy. A John W. Loveton production.